There's a line from Pitchfork's initial review of Radiohead's classic album, Kid A, that I think about from time to time. The writer was so overwhelmed by how brilliant the album was that he simply said, breathing people made this record. I felt a similar feeling near the end of the 2019-20 NBA season when I heard people say, based on some catch-all metrics, that Darius Garland is the worst player in the NBA. Breathing people considered something this stupid. On the one hand, it's true by nearly every catch-all metric that we have for basketball, Garland struggled during his rookie season. The numbers told us the what, but not the why. The context of Garland's entrance into the NBA was complex. He was heavily impacted by the fact that his one season at Vanderbilt was cut woefully short by a knee injury during his fifth game, and after declaring for the draft at the beginning of 2019, he was forced to undergo yet another procedure to clean up the inside of that same knee. That procedure kept him out of summer league and put him in the tough position of simultaneously rehabbing and adjusting to two higher levels of basketball in just a little over a year without really getting to, you know, play. It had some of his fans, myself included, saying, These setbacks are disastrous for his development. Times were tough on all fronts, but as of late, it feels like we're back on track. His conditions and his play having improved, it bears some examination. Is Darius Garland's dramatic increase in production more of a course correction or a fluky surprise? If you don't know, Darius Kennard Garland is a six foot one, wickedly fast and terrifically skilled second generation NBA point guard from Gary, Indiana. This is DG's third season in the league after the Cleveland Cavaliers selected him fifth overall in the 2019 NBA draft. Normally during episodes of The Leap, we talk about what a player could do to hit the all-star level of play, but Darius beat me to the punch. He was an all-star selection for the 2021-22 season, and justifiably so, with the explosion of production that he's enjoyed. I'm sure that when the Cleveland coaching staff decided to put the ball in DG's hands, this is exactly how they hoped it would go. With the highest usage rate of his career, Garland has responded by upping more or less all of his counting stats. He's averaging 21.4 points per game, 8.6 assists, and 1.2 steals, and he's hitting on 37.2% of his 6.8 three-point attempts. He's also posting his highest pick-and-roll and isolation efficiencies to date. Darius isn't a physically imposing player aside from being laterally twitchy and fast in the open court. He's solidly built, not overly skinny, but also not overly stout with a 6'5 wingspan. What makes Garland special is the balance and the richness of his skill set. Growing up, he's listed his emulation touch points as Chris Paul, Kyrie Irving, Steve Nash, and of course, his dad, Winston Garland. Aspiring to be like three of the most skilled players ever to play the sport is definitely ambitious, but watching Garland play doesn't feel ridiculous at all. I've always said that I think the economy of DG's handle reminds me of someone who played with his dad, the elder Tim Hardaway. Now, when I say economy, I'm talking about the way Garland doesn't really play around with his food. He unleashes succinct, effective dribble combos that almost seem like they could have kung fu sound effects set to them. Handle alone is fun, it preps the development of other skills, but Garland really separates himself in that he's able to use that handle to weaponize the rest of his game. Darius is a respectable, crafty, and creative below-the-rim finisher for his size. However, it's the shooting that gets the people going. Darius Garland was born to let it fly His cross is slain defenders You seek but will not find Darius Garland It doesn't take a Jerry West level scout to watch him take a couple of shots for a person to say, The boy has the gift. Mechanically, there's nothing to gripe about. He gets balanced quickly, even coming out of a dead sprint. His load up and energy transfer are consistently smooth. And just look at how straight that elbow stays over and over. I'd also add that Garland has one of the harder, flickier wrist flexing motions that I've ever seen. He makes absolutely sure that that ball flies exactly where it's supposed to. This has scientific backing. According to Second Spectrum, the average arc angle of one of Garland's jumpers 
is 49.8 degrees, which is in the 94th percentile of the league. Maybe it's nature, maybe it's nurture, but watch Darius' dad shoot this dribble jumper back in 1987. Similar sweetness. That glorious shot is put to use in a variety of ways. He can do it off of screens. Only Steph Curry and Duncan Robinson have had more off-screen actions run for them this year. And DG is a killer in those situations. On the season, he's shooting 50% on all off-screen looks and 39% from three. But with an increase in touches and usage, one of Garland's most prominent leaps this season has been in his self-created threes, shooting off the bounce. From last season to this season, he's seen an over 20% increase in his number of unassisted threes. His most lethal weapon is the step back three. Over a fifth of his self-created looks are step backs and he's shooting a scorching 49.3% on those looks. The tightness of his handle combined with the severity of his stop-start ability, it's pure violence. Violence? Yes, Dirk Diggler, I said violence. It's savagery and dynamic savagery at that. He can get to his step back in a number of ways, making it less predictable in general. He really loves to hop to his left, and if defenders meet him beyond the line, he'll often use a setup crossover dribble from left to right, followed by a lefty hang dribble to briefly sell the drive. After that ball hangs in his left hand for a split second, he makes a hard left to right dribble that's synced with a forward right step, and this usually moves the defender backward a step, which is the amount of separation that he's looking for as he quickly hops backward and gets set. Three ball. Blam! Respect is earned in the NBA. In the same way that we flinch if we think someone might actually punch us, fear is cultivated by the belief that something could actually happen. Because Garland's shooting is proven at this point, his aggressiveness in hunting his shot is no coincidence. It's by design, and that has had an impact on Cleveland's overall offense. Defenses have no choice but to wade into deep waters with him, and from there, things don't get any simpler. Into the draft, my initial projection on Garland was that this was a scoring league guard who was a willing passer, one who would be best suited next to a bigger playmaker who can enable him to roam. What I failed to give him credit for was his playmaking, and enough ain't been said about that. We talked about the shooting, but I think the entire basketball world should take a moment to appreciate the touch that's present throughout Garland's game, in his handle, in his shooting, and also in his passing. I am ready to say that he is in the elite category of this conversation at only 22 years old. When these three facets work together in a knowing balance with one another, beautiful things happen. I mean, watch this lefty live dribble overhanded pass to Mobley, placed right between his hands in the basket so that all he has to do is dunk it. But passing and playmaking aren't always necessarily the same thing. Great passers can simply seize what's there, which is valuable, but the best playmakers in the world are experts at manipulating and creating something that could be there. Watch Garland use that hang dribble again, this time to tease Randall's eagerness to continue test his shot, and then attack middle. He actually fakes two people out here. He forces RJ Barrett to jump all the way into the gap with a left-footed jab, which forces Evan Fournier to sprint up to zone Chetty Osman and Isaac Okoro. Then Garland absolutely sells this kick out with a head and shoulder fake, but then fires it to the corner to Okoro, who promptly squanders the dime drop. Another major development in Garland's game has been his patience when navigating the middle of the floor. In high traffic areas and half court, smaller guards have to find ways to be the warden and not the prisoner. Part of his evolution has been to move away from seeing every drive as a linear one action, one reaction sequence. There are times when he'll drive, draw help, and find a cutting finisher like he does here with Jared Allen, but sometimes the defensive response is going to be good enough to require a second or a third decision from the handler, and learning this has been a process for Garland. Those occasions can call for Garland to simply keep his dribble alive and probe to the other side of the floor instead of being goaded into a tough shot or a disadvantaged pass. This can lead to sequences like this one that are positively Nash Amari-esque. That ability to get to spots and play with patience has really enhanced his lane game. Because of his expert touch shooting in the lane, shooting floaters, Darius has also become a skilled manipulator of the balance between engaging the backline defender by threatening to shoot a floater and throwing a lob to a teammate in the dunker spot. His efficiency shooting that shot is up 13.2% from a year ago, and his increase in completed passes has both improved his lane assist numbers and lowered his turnovers. 
Better targets also help, and I think it's somewhat safe to say that Evan Mobley and Jared Allen are upgrades this season for Cleveland. Granted, if you're going to make an offensive omelet, you're going to break some eggs. DG does have a tendency to get swallowed up by a crowd and transition and have trailing defenders surprise him, and many of his turnovers are blocked attempts at a lob, but overall the aggressiveness is great. I've always thought that sequential thinking is really important for initiators at this level. Watch this five-play sequence from overtime of Cleveland's March 14th win over the Clippers. First possession. Garland gets off to a rough start in this left side pick and roll with Mobley. He slowly works his way to the middle with Amir Coffee on his back, and instead of simply bouncing this to Mobley when he has the chance, he gets himself in a compromised position by trying to skip this pass to Karis Lavert. And Terrence Mann, aka the Boat Rocker, is all over it. Second possession. Cleveland changes it up. Garland is the screener. Knowing the Clippers are switching everything, he gets Batum now and wheels straight into a dribble handoff with Mobley. This time he snakes it, coming right to left as a probe to see what the defense does. And sure enough, they come with him. Now DG suddenly has a ton of space to loft the beautiful pass over the top to Mobley and he finishes it. Third possession. This time Terrence Mann top locks to prevent the switch. Mobley comes to set the screen. Mann goes under. Blam. Fourth possession, same thing, high ball screen coming left. Man comes over the screen to prevent Garland from shooting another three. Zubac meets him higher in a hard hedge. Garland says, cool, I'll just throw this to my big. Mobley fakes this pass to Lavert, which opens up a Coro, layup, and one. Finally, the Clippers pay Garland the ultimate respect by saying, we'd rather play four on three than have you make a decision. And they blitz him once he crosses the timeline. He gets rid of it in just in time. Drive, kick, drive, kick, drive, kick, three, ball game. Defensively, a player like Garland has limited options in terms of role. He's not going to be super switchable, he's not going to be a mistake eraser, and typically he's not going to be taking on the toughest perimeter assignments. Early on, it was tough sledding on this front. He lacked the strength to bother drivers, and in switches, it was tough for him to compete with the strength or the length of taller shot creators. He's had to fight tooth and nail to get his head above water in this sense, and slowly but surely, he's made up ground. Garland has quick hands, and I've never found his defensive effort to be lacking, but added strength and familiarity with the NBA game have helped him to be less of a liability on an island against a bigger scorer. When guards of Garland's size are this productive, teams have to find ways to keep them on the floor. And the obvious way to do that is by optimizing the roster. Surround them with players that can amplify their strengths and cover their weaknesses. Luckily, the Cavs have been able to do that with their recent acquisitions. Likely Rookie of the Year Evan Mobley and first-time All-Star Jared Allen are a luxury to have, both are extremely long, nimble athletes with above average anticipation and timing, and their versatility enables lineup flexibility. It also enables Garland, used primarily as a point of attack defender, to play aggressively in ball screens. Still, on the offensive end, I do worry a bit that once teams find themselves in a playoff series with Cleveland, they will put all of their focus on Garland as a means of shutting Cleveland's water off. I saw multiple occasions this season when he was played aggressively with body bumps and swipes, and he failed to get the benefit of the doubt. There are some long, daunting rosters out there. When they aren't about to brawl with each other, physical switchable teams like the Miami Heat can put a positionally clever on-ball defender like P.J. Tucker on him, with an uber-athlete like Bam Adebayo waiting around the corner at the level of the screen, making it difficult to take this shot that he loves, while also having the ability to mirror DG into the paint. They even have Jimmy Butler sitting patiently on this diagonal passing lane. An antidote to this could be to occasionally move Garland out of the crosshairs and prevent the defense from loading up on him. This was easier to do when the Cavs could roll out lineups with Ricky Rubio, another clever pass-first point guard, which freed DG up to move without the ball. Darius Garland has the respect of his elders and his peers. I'm going to go with Darius Garland. Nice pick. DG, the PG. I know you wanted him, KD. I know you wanted him, KD. I know you know I did. That's why you did that. <laughs> but uh, I know Darius real well too. I've known him since he was in high school. He's so shifty, man. And he 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 one of the guys that I love to watch when I'm at home watching games. Obviously, Darius is a, a young, you know, great player. I think he's uh, going to be a superstar. What a remarkable turn of basketball events the past 12 months have been for the Cavs, who have managed to nearly double their win total already and establish themselves as a, these dudes are fearless and they're going to be a pain in the ass in a playoff series team. 
Once a huge worry, the pressure seems to be totally off of the Sexton Garland dynamic. Karis LeVert could prove to be the splash of self-created splash that the Cavs need for their offense. And when he isn't getting utterly posterized, even Kevin Love has had a little extra pep in his step. Of course, much of this has to do with the addition of the seven foot Evan Mobley, one of the most promising front court prospects of the past 20 years. He and Garland fit together like a megazord of speed, precision, and just vibes, man. They're almost like a course correction for the Garnett Marbury years that we as basketball fans never really got. The bad news is that the Eastern Conference has become a goddamn minefield. This is a fun young team, but big time accolades come with big time challenges as the Cavs start to focus on not only feeling good, but turning those good vibes into tangible results. Darius Garland will play a huge role in that. So where does he go from here? Assuming and hoping that he stays healthy, there are usual suspects. Continuing to grow his comfort in traffic against physical defensive pressure, counting on the premise that his reputation in the league should increase his trips to the free throw line, expanding his situational counters. He's shown that he's a fluid playmaking problem solver. Just how good can he get? I was conservative about that in the past, so I hesitate to do it again, because the man that they call Boog has given the basketball world ample reason to believe. Let me know if you agree.